All right, I want to welcome you to this webinar, uh, which is part of our quality online course series on accessibility, usability, and student support. My name is Dan Cabrera, and this particular workshop aligns with Quality Matters Standards 7 and 8. So if you're familiar with Quality Matters, uh, but of course it makes more sense if you do, but that's okay. We're not going to focus too much on Quality Matters Standards. We're going to focus more on those best practices in an online design, an online course design, that really helps and supports your students. So again, my name is Dan Cabrera and I'm the Multimedia Coordinator for the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. Here are some ways that you can contact me and connect with me. So if you have any offline questions that you want to discuss or some ideas that you want to discuss with me, just reach out and I'll be happy to have a conversation in more detail with any of you. So I'll be moving quickly because we do cover, uh, it does cover two of the Quality Matters standards. There's a lot packed into this presentation this afternoon, but it's also one that's pretty practical. So there's not a lot of theory. There's some really practical tips that I'm going to give you in this workshop. Let's begin by talking about some factors that can influence the success of our online students. And so you can read through the bullet points yourself. I might pick a couple out. There are things that really influence all of our students' success, but maybe they're a little bit more obvious uh, when you're in an online environment. One of them I'm going to pick out, actually, is isolation. Okay. So the fact that students may never be coming to campus, may be interacting with this online course, sitting in the comfort of their own home is a likely scenario. That's great, but they can also feel that a sense of isolation or isolationism. So we want to make sure that we alleviate some of those barriers and those other things that get in the way of student success in an online course. So these factors that really tie into this idea of accessibility and usability. So just keep all of these factors in mind. This is our target that we're going to try to make, uh, only try to make uh, these influences stronger and better so that students do feel a sense of support from you and from the institution. So my objectives for this afternoon, for the next 55 minutes or so, we're going to explore how usability and accessibility can set your students up for success. And we're also going to talk about how you can provide ways that your students can connect with valuable support services, and especially helping your students learn how to connect with these valuable services is, again, one of those just really practical things that's so meaningful for your online uh, students and for the students' experience in this online course. So let's start with the first one, usability. I think it's something that we may be very nervous about, it, as a student certainly is. If they're new to an online environment, they're going to want to know how they can participate and use the tools and how they're going to navigate through the course. All these things are going through their heads uh, that are above and beyond the actual content. So that's why some of these strategies and these design principles really help your course to be usable by your students. So let's talk a little bit about what, might, what it might look like. So as far as usability goes, you really want to plan out your navigation of your course. And that's, uh, that's the design phase. That's the development phase as you're putting your course together. So it begins well before you teach your, that first session of the course. How do you want the navigation to work for your students? Something that's going to be predictable, consistent throughout the student's experience. You want to label things and, and label them in ways that make sense. So here, here's how we're going to go over the, uh, some of that. 
I begin by saying, okay, plan out your navigation. Here's how it's a sample course that was uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, a sample course that was put together. Here's how you could do it that would plan out your navigation a little bit. You could start with an area that begins with a welcome here. Now you need to be very clear for the students that this is where you want them to begin. This is where they should begin. I want to give them some pointers on what navigation is going to look like. And then you can see the different ways that uh, you, you can label this navigation. Now in this planning phase, you might be planning out what you're going to call them, what makes the most sense to add into different categories. Now in some ways here at NIU, we have a default menu that you can use. Sometimes it's just getting rid of things that you know are not going to, uh, you're not going to use in your own course and limiting or eliminating them from the menu or you can just tie them. So as far as planning these things out, things may shift and change, but at least you're thinking about it up front. And then when your students are in the course, you're letting them know how they use their environment and how the navigation has been designed. And if you've been thinking about this and planning it well in advance, it'll be clear in your own mind. So my second piece of advice on usability is to chunk. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting term. Chunk and organize your content up. And I always say that that's, there's two favorable ways, I think, of using chunk. One is for the designing courses and making your content available, breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. So how do we chunk up and, orga and organize our course? Well, you can chunk it up using folders. So this is a Blackboard folder here. This is a Blackboard folder icon, actually. You don't have to call them modules like we're doing in this example. You can call them weekly folders. You can call them units. You can call them sessions. You can call them weeks, week one, week two. You can break, break things down into topics, but the idea is that you break them down, chunk them up, and into those bite-sized pieces so that students see everything is organized into these packets rather than having all of the content available at the same time, which can be overwhelming for any student. One of the things that uh, you can also do with these folders is you can use adaptive release. So you can adapt and release them so that folders are designed and developed in your course, but they'll be hidden from your students until the week or the weeks before the week before the course starts. Just so students are seeing maybe the most relevant information at the top. You can see in this case, I have them with module nine down below. Module nine would have been available earlier. Um, but then subsequent to that, that would be December 5th, and then module 10, it becomes available December 12th. And so because I've reversed ordered them and because they're adaptive release, the most relevant content appears at the top, will always appear at the top of the list so they don't have to scroll down and, and figure out what module they're working on this, uh, this particular week. And I during module 11, that would open up and be at the top once again once we reach that uh, period of time. So that's another recommendation to reverse order your modules to make it easier for your students. I happened to be talking with a group last week and they were talking about looking at an online course, a sample online course, and there's so much information in there. So one of the ways to package up and reduce the students seeing so much information at first is to hide them, is to hide these folders, and then have them become available to the students when it's relevant to them. So that was a lot on usability and navigation and just really a couple of slides. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have on those. I will pause just for a minute, but if there isn't any questions, we can move on to accessibility. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat area or you can raise your hand and if you have a microphone, you can actually ask the question. So I'll take this time to wait for any questions that may come in. This is the active learning portion of it where I'm encouraging in individuals in the session to engage with, with not just me, but with also other members of the, um, the session. Now, while I'm waiting, I also want to mention that the, the topics, accessibility, usability, are interrelated with each other. So I think you'll find that some of that usability will definitely come out 
and when I talk about accessibility. Once again, so raise your hands or even a yes in the text chat area if you have a question. Okay, I don't see I don't see anyone. That, it must have been clear. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay, so I have another question, and this one I actually would like you to to participate in. How many of you were really interested in this session because of the topic of accessibility? All right. So in this case right here, I won't have a poll, but I I just want you to jack. All right. Let's see. Jack, did you have a question? I, I see that you lowered your hand. You must have raised it before and I didn't notice. Well, I guess not. So nobody nobody uh, was interested in this because specifically of the topic of accessibility. Oh, Xiaoshu. Thank you so much, Xiaoshu. All right, and we have Natalie, of course. Thank you, Natalie. Sharif, I'm interested to learn about UDL. Oh my gosh, that is one of my favorite topics. In fact, I've, I have presented on that before. Thank you so much, Sharif. All right, well, I thought that that might be the case. Okay, thank you for responding to uh, um, in this way. So one of the reasons I get through, usab uh, get through usability maybe a bit more quickly uh, then what I'm going to spend time in accessibility. So we can start talking about accessibility at this point. Oh, Candace says, I'm interested because I will be teaching online in the fall and I'm shadowing someone's class now and find it very confusing. Wow, we don't want confusing. That's not, that's not necessarily the best way to learn about something. So let's see if we can, we can handle some of these things. Your classes are, have never looked confusing. Well, thank you, Candace. All right, so here we go. So I'm going to begin by giving you some of the definitions that really speak to me on what accessibility is. So what are these defini what, what are these definitions and assess what it means to me? So these are some that I kind of pulled out. So, of course, uh, first of all, accessibility refers to the quality of being available when needed. So that helps a lot uh, to do with, it has a lot to do with um, being accessible to our students. We want them to be, want to be available to them, but we also want our materials to be available to them as well. Now, that may seem obvious, well, but that's not what I really mean by accessibility. Now, that's one aspect of accessibility, being available to our students and available to them when it's needed. Uh, another definition is that anything that we develop and design into our course must be easy to use, is approachable by a diverse body of students. Okay. And the students are really able to equally participate in the online course. Finally, this last one, obtainable and attainable. So what do I mean by that? Well, obtainable means it ties back a little bit more to that ease of use so that the students can have access to our materials. And how obtainable on a scale of 1 to 10 are they? And also, is your course attainable? And that has to do with can the students reach their goals or objectives uh, for you uh, that you have for them? Can they attain a high level of achievement? So we design a course to be accessible. We really want to think about these definitions and the different nuances around them. But we are most likely to think about accessibility. We're thinking when we are thinking about it, we're thinking about our students with disabilities. It's probably the first thing that comes to mind. So students may require accommodations. Maybe they have a disability, whether it's a visible or invisible one. And so here at Northern, we have a disability policy that is a requirement to go on all syllabi. We also have an excellent disability resource center. So, so one of the ways that we want to, to support our students is, first of all, let them know about the ADA statement that we have. Let them know that, uh, that it's there, but also that we support the disability statement. 
And you can see right here an example. This is just a copy. This is a screen capture of how the disability uh, uh, statement appears in a course. Uh, and then I also added some links here so you might have this information in your syllabus. But I really recommend that you put a little bit uh, more front and center so that students are reminded that those resources are available to them and that they can tap into them when they need to. And so I add into my own courses a link to the Disability Resource Center. Let me just put that up here. Okay. And then some other content here that's that's relevant to that. Let's just let me put that here. That's relevant relevant to accessibility. And then maybe one more. Okay. So I've also added some uh, other links uh, just just to help students understand where these policies are coming from and other supports and standards that are out there for them. And again, let me just advance this line here. Then again, uh, that could look like it did on the last slide in your uh, in your page, but I, I want, wanted to make sure that you have all this information uh, for you. I've curated a lot of these resources for you, and I'm going to actually put several links into the text check stat, not the text chat area so that you can bookmark them right now and have them uh, to put in your course. So uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the first one I'm going to add or I added was the Disability Resource Center link. It's likely that other institutions have similar types of resources. The important part is that you just added in there uh, this for your online students. You can also connect with them with other communications connecting with the resource centers. So again, this is just some information that we have here at NIU. So I did talk about how we often start by thinking about our students that maybe have an accommodation, or you know you're really thinking about how we can support our students with disabilities. But the whole idea of accessibility is to be able to support a real diverse population of students, students with a range of abilities uh, from one spectrum to the other. And anytime you use universal design principles and designing your course is really going to help you meet those accessibility guidelines. But it's also going to benefit really the majority of your students, not just the students with, uh, with identified disability. So when I talk about universal design, I'm only going to talk about it briefly. I'm, and I'm reminded of a workshop series that Yvonne Johnson and I collaborated on a couple of years ago in faculty development. So I'm going to add a link here. So if there's any more that you would like to learn about universal design, definitely check out the recordings of some of these earlier online workshops. Here we go. I'm going to put that link here. So what will happen is that you'll come to this page, and you'll have to scroll down just a bit to see the three different online workshops that we did, the recordings from those workshops that we did. So here again, some practical tips on ways that you might make your course more universal and friendly, more accessible for that diverse body of students in your course. So one thing is to provide any printed materials in an alternative format. So creating a Word document and making it accessible in an accessible PDF, for instance, would be more likely than your, uh, that your printed materials would be screen readable, which is really important. So if you have a PDF that's just a, an image file, that probably is not going to happen. That's not going to be available. So you do want to make it in a format that your, a screen reader can, uh, can have access to. I see we had someone come in right now. Great. OK. So that's an important thing for students that have uh, either low or no vision. You want to make sure any font styles and sizes are really legible. And it's really for all students, even those that don't necessarily have low vision. But you know, it takes away from some of the clutter uh, from a document. And there are so many choices that we have now between how we design our PowerPoint slides to which buttons we pick in our left-hand navigation menu. So we really want to make sure that any kind of fonts 
uh, again, are really legible and clear. So they would be the sans serif, uh, like like this one. So this looks like it's aerial. Okay, so it's not going to have that special foot that appears on the bottom of a lot of the letters with these serif serif um, options. I also want you to think about your use of negative space. So that's all that space around where your text and your pictures are. And it really helps, again, reduce the clutter. And it also gives an emphasis or a focus on the important parts of any kind of instructional materials that you're putting together for your students. If you're using audio, make sure that your audio is clear, that you take some time to script, uh, script out whatever you're going to be speaking so that you know the points you're going to make and that things become clear that way. Believe me, that's uh, that's how I do a lot of my my own uh, uh, lecturing. I have a pre-written script, and I try to stick with that because ultimately, what you're going to do is you're going to take that script and you're going to use it in your captioning. Now, if you're using long videos, you're going to here we're using that word again. We're going to chunk them up. We're going to make them. Uh, we're going to break them down into bite-sized pieces, and that would help your students stay focused. You don't want to have a hour or maybe even a half an hour video. It's really difficult uh, to keep them on task. So by making them shorter, briefer, sharper, chunking them up, it'll keep them from uh, diverting into other topics. And the research has shown that, you know, the shorter the video, the more attention that students are going to have. So I want to ask, are there any questions? Do I have any questions? Oh, I see that Lauren is typing something. Okay. All right. It's coming. It's coming. While it's being prepared, I, I have something that just popped into my mind. Does a universal design workshop cover how to create various instructional materials to meeting learning, learner demands from students with diverse abilities? Yes, uh, hearing and visual impairments give you a lot of ideas on, on, on how to do that. So yeah, those, those recorded recordings actually do have that. And it's a little bit of what we're covering right now. So for instance, we talk about students with visual disabilities, and we're also going to be talking a little bit about students with little or no hearing abilities. And actually, that's one of the ways we're going to be moving on in just a minute, right here. Actually, thank you, Xiaoshu. What I'm going to do is, um, Xiaoshu asked for some best practices examples. I'm going to give a best practice example in the next slide. All right. So that's really a, a good segue. All right. So here are some alternatives, uh, some other ways that we can we can do it besides being creating a uh, creating a PDF uh, of a document. In Blackboard, you can actually use Quick Links, and Quick Links are for keyboard only students, so that those students that have low uh, lower or no vision, and they also they only use the keyboard, so they know how to navigate through a web page or a learning environment, uh, learning management system like Blackboard if the links are set up correctly. And of course, that's the caveat. So this is actually happening in the background of your Blackboard course that you may not even be aware of. Um, I know that before I was preparing for this, I wasn't aware of it. But if you're, you happen to be in Blackboard and you click on, you have this combination of Shift-Alt, let's see, of Shift-Alt-L uh, right here, open the Quick Links, you will see Quick Links Navigation. And okay, that's what this is right here. So once again, Shift Alt L, and that's uh, what I'm showing on this page. And basically, it becomes almost an outline, and then that keyboard-only student can know how to click through the menu. It will be kind of uh, it will be read out loud to them if they're using a screen reader. And I'm trying to decide just how to describe that a little bit, but it's actually really kind of a cool um, feature. It's using the quick links. So just looking at the quick links, I think. Uh, you're, it's a pretty good idea about how you have things in your course structured and how navigation does work. 
So it's really just a good thing to do. So to look through how the navigation is working using the quick links. Although the quick links are actually for students with visual disabilities, everyone can benefit. And actually, especially use the instructor, you can see if things make sense, if they have a logical flow. A couple of other things you can do anytime you add a graph or a picture or an image, you want to use the alt tag. You've probably seen it come up maybe and you, you've just clicked it, buy it because you were just trying to add a lot of pictures, but it's important for your students to understand that the, what the image was uh, because they may not be able to actually see it. So if you have an alt tag that describes what it is, it'll be, it'll be much clearer to the students and it'll be a big help to the students. All right. So alt tags using your quick links and using your quick links are available to your students. Uh, and these are some great things to have. I want to make sure that I get all of my notes on that. So I did a little, a little bit about students with hearing disabilities as far as having that audio to be really clear. And that may be for more students with English as a second language as, an, as another population. So it just doesn't, it doesn't impact one specific uh, disability. It's actually for everyone, a range of abilities, as I mentioned uh, earlier. This is also beneficial for students, but it's very, very important for students with no hearing to be able to benefit from closed captioning and transcripts, which is what we see right here. So the second screenshot I have over here is actually an example from a MOOC that my colleagues, Tracy Miller and Stephanie Richter, assisted a faculty member with several years ago. It's called, the MOOC was called Perspectives on Disability. And everything was closed caption. So students with little or no hearing can actually read through the closed captioning. You can take those closed captions and you, and you can also create a transcript so that students are able to read through the transcripts. Again, great benefits to all students. Students can really benefit, especially if they're in a noisy environment. Say they happen to be going home on a train and they're trying to catch up on the work. And it's pretty noisy. And in this case right here, by having the transcripts, by having the closed captions, they can actually read through the closed captions, or they're listening to it, they're reading it, and that just helps. That combination of modality, multiple modalities, helps the students with, with the content. So closed captioning and transcripts are great things to do, and actually they're required by federal law. It used to be that students need, needed just the, the transcripts of anything that you had on video, and that's still the case for an audio that you are sharing. For instance, I have uh, my weekly greeting, which is just an audio recording, and I, I do include transcripts. But if you're using video, uh, the, the current uh, conventional wisdom now is saying that closed captions also need to be provided so that students are matching up the visual. Let's say that you're explaining a graph or a chart with the script or the words that you're actually saying on the screen. So as far as creating some alternatives, I, I think, again, I would recommend that you check out the Universal Design Series as well. It's always easier um, when you see an example. Okay. So one way of doing this is to use YouTube auto captioning. Okay, one of the things that I, I recommend somewhat, I guess, is all fairly good captioning at this point. It's not perfect, and it certainly does not do anything like punctuations or capitalizations. Or may, there may be some technical terms that are unique to your discipline that that uh, it may not be able to um, to change from the spoken word to a written word. But if you start with the auto captions from YouTube, it's fairly easy to, to actually make some quick changes. And you'll be able to close caption your videos for your students, again, to make them more accessible to your students. But also, you're getting ahead of it, uh, of this, so that if you do have a student, say, maybe two or three semesters down the road uh, that needs an accommodation, all of your content and instructional materials have already been made accessible. And the work has been already done. So it seems like some of the upfront work definitely is a valuable, uh, is a valuable process or activity upfront. It's going to save you time in the long run, and again, it's really important uh, for your student success. Another, another pretty easy tip if you're using an external technology, and you want to add links in your course for what those accessibility policies are for that external tool. And it's also going to have the have you. Uh, it's also going to have you check it out before you know that maybe the tools that you're picking 
may or may not be as accessible uh, as you were hoping. So if you, you want to choose an example, uh, then students, of course, can look it up uh, if they'd like to as well. So then in my example right here, I'm using VoiceThread. Now, VoiceThread is a really cool external tool. It's actually a way to annotate over PowerPoint um, and then share it with the class so that students uh, students actually can, can view the PowerPoint and then they can make comments on it. So if I have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, I can actually have a student who's viewing it type or, or record an audio uh, um, uh, question. But wh what did you mean by this thing in this on this slide? Okay. So and then uh, so we have multiple ways for them to input. They can either type in a message, they can use their phone, leave a message, or you can use a microphone, or even use camera, a, a webcam. And it gives them a lot of choice, which is always important in accessibility. But I also like to point out the policy that VoiceThread uses. So they talk about, I think, maybe some of the more hidden disabilities, but they also refer to the learners as differently labeled. And so I think VoiceThread has a really good handle on only creating the most accessible tool. And I'm gonna I'm going to leave a I'm gonna post a a link to their policy on, on this on accessibility. I think it's a really cool policy. So we just talked a little bit about accessibility. Anyone else add in your chat area anything else that you'd like to share? Maybe some best practices that you do when you're thinking about accessibility for your students. So once again, this is the active portion of the webinar. So if you use anything, um, then why don't you share it with us? One that just popped into my, my head, actually. I, uh, if you're using Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, like we're doing right now, you can actually use a captionist in this environment. So if you have a student that has an accommodation that requires a captionist in your live online courses, and you're going to use Collaborate, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, you can contact the Disability Resource Center, and you can arrange for a captionist to be part of the live session like this. And it's fairly easy to do. It's just promoting the person that joins the session, this is the captionist, to the role of captionist, and that live closed caption is right there for your students. Not just the students with a hearing disability, but a student uh, any student, as a matter of fact. Another example would be to check in with students at the beginning of the semester and ask them what types of files that work best for them. That's really, really a good idea because um, uh, you're actually asking for their input. And it doesn't seem, uh, it doesn't even seem like maybe there's too much work involved because you know. Uh, you're just asking them a question, but I, I should provide a little bit of caution with that because uh, you know what? What if they suddenly tell you they want everything in Flash or something like that, and you're not able to do that? But certainly, if you give students a couple of different options and let them know what options you prefer, that's that's probably a really good idea. Okay, so right now I, I don't see anybody with best practice examples in their own class, and that's fine. Uh, okay, I'm going to make it quick. Let's see, Orton. Okay. Get back to my, okay. Okay, Natalie says, uh, sometimes maybe just offering the PowerPoints ahead of time helps students take notes. So they can watch, they can listen to the class, and they have a PowerPoint to guide them. Thank you so much, Natalie. Appreciate that. Great. Candace says, uh, if we have a collaborate session in an online course, uh, we need a real-time caption if a student has captioning in their accommodations. Yes. Once again, that's something you contact the Disability Resource Center, Candace, uh, so that they can arrange for captions to sit in the class, and you would be sending them the link, of course, and they have the equipment to, to be able to post that that captioning. You just have to, you as the moderator, the instructor, just has to change their role from a participant or attendee to a captionist, and that's relatively easy to do. Thank you, Candice and, and Natalie. So we're uh, switching gears here again, and we're going to talk about academic support.
and student services and how it may be a little different, maybe a lot different in your online courses. So first of all, I'd like to call out the great work by some of the tutoring folks who are on campus. They have created these five minute tutorials and I'm going to share the link to access them right now. Great. All right. Now different departments have more or have more and more online tutoring options for students. And so if that's something that you do have available to your students in your department or you come across one that really makes sense to your department or your discipline, let your students know that there's tutoring available for them. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of searching around, but when you find them, you know again that that's going to be something that, uh, that you might have uh, ability to refer your students to. Uh, if they were in your face-to-face -face course, of course, you'd be, you'd be more familiar with those tutoring opportunities. But make sure that you try to connect your students with those uh, if, if you are online. Make sure that they're, they're aware of them. And that, that would be something you would share with your students somewhere in your course, somewhere in the navigation. Now, maybe you have a graduate teaching assistant that would be more willing to do some online tutoring sessions. So let your students know, connect with your students with these tutoring opportunities. And once again, I did provide a link to that. So our library here at NIU, and let's see, let me find, uh, okay, I'm going to share another link right now. Okay. It's like the one I've uh, I've shared. It's available to you. The library has a bunch of, of online types of opportunities to connect with students. So there's this one right here, Ask a Librarian. And even if uh, and even librarians that are subject specialists can help their students either. Uh, again, you can see with maybe doing a, uh, on how to cite, finding a new reference, ordering journals and book chapters from our database. All of these things are available to your students. You know, even though we think about the library as being very physical location here in DeKalb, you, you know, Founders Library is a really huge part of, of the NIU community and, and the DeKalb community for that matter. It's also a great uh, source for online students. And this, this uh, uh, link that I'm sharing actually is to have access to uh, materials and, and, and documentation and a whole host of, of tutorials uh, from uh, the online uh, site for Founders Library. Now the library also has been moving toward and uh, using more and more open educational resources, OER. So we're looking for more and more electronic free or for students to use textbooks and, and other resources. In fact, uh, I've, we've actually had members of the library come and talk about OER uh, in the summer last year and then again in the fall semester. So I think it's, it, it's definitely moving, a movement that's taken uh, hold. So keep your eyes open for anything you hear from the library, that OER textbook, open textbook for your students, because part of the idea is of accessibility is that it's also accessible for students that might have financial situations. So how, how is this accessible to them in terms of finances? Of course, that's a big, uh, a big barrier to a lot of folks. And you know that when those, uh, that those textbooks are so expensive. I had uh, two, uh, two of my children, college graduates, and oh my gosh, the bill that they get for textbooks. So our library is really moving more and more toward these open free textbooks on textbooks. So check it out uh, if you get a chance. Okay. All right, student support. Now, before we get on, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. I've been going pretty, pretty fast here. Okay, I don't see anyone typing anything in yet, so I guess no questions. All right, so let's move on. Student support. Student support. So this is another thing that came up recently. So there's a lot uh, that we're providing for our online students that maybe we don't know, we don't do as, as much of in our face-to-face -face courses because really face-to-face -face students, at least those incoming freshmen and freshmen and those incoming transfer students, they get an orientation, a face-to-face -face orientation. And they walk through a lot of these things and when they come uh, into our course, they've already been introduced to them. We're not to the point where that's quite happening for our online students. So again, it's fairly easy. It's a fairly easy thing to do. We can at least point them in the right direction. 
So there's more and more of these student support units here on campus that actually have an online component to them. So one of them is the Writing Center. You probably have used the Writing Center for your students, at least in, in invited them to that. Okay. So here's a, here's a link to that. So the Writing Center has a Google Hangout. We will actually do an online tutoring session with students, which I think is really cool. It's actually tied to the first year composition program. So if your students are maybe struggling with writing, and maybe your course is more writing intensive, you can actually set them up with the Writing Center, and they can get some more support that way. Let's see, I want to make sure I give all of the different support units. Some of these might be a little bit more outside of the academic support. But there's also uh, some different just, well, let's see, another one, student support counseling and other things that can turn and provide your students with links so that they can benefit from those services that we already have on campus. So let's check them out. So let me just do Acad Office of Academic Success. Okay, we'll provide that there. It's really kind of an important thing. Now, taking a, a little bit more about academic ones, here again, here are some of the functions. We have the, the A-plus program, the peer-assisted learning, supplemental uh, instruction. All of these are beginning down more and, and more having an access online uh, presence. There's at least a phone number and a website for your students to be able to tap into some of those resources. The Career Resource Center, let me just get the link for that one. It's a long link, here we go. It has some online tools that'll help your students build their resumes. They can search for internships online. Uh, now, Maybe that's a little different if the internship seems to be very local, maybe in DeKalb, for instance. But they may also have to expand that out a little bit. And that is something that, again, is building more and more every time I look at these different support units. There is a Husky to Husky online mentoring program. Let me add that link here. So that's a mentoring between an alumni and a current student. And again, it's done online. So those students are still able to connect with our community as a whole, which is a lot of getting back to that first thing we talked about, which is isolation. It's really important for the students to feel like they're connected with the broader community. That sense of belonging really helps their achievement, but also retains the students because they do feel like there's a connection with the university. So again, check out a lot of these resources. Add them to your course, or at least a link to your course. This is all about quality online course design. Part of your design should be adding those student resource areas. We go back to our left-hand navigation. That idea that the students will be able to understand the course right from the start. Maybe you might want to include a link that says student support or how to get help. Again, it's up to you on how you want to describe them to your students. The idea is that you just provide them with that information. Now, can any student use Husky, online Husky to Husky mentoring? Well, yes, they can. It actually started for the face-to-face -face students, but the face-to-face -face students may be on campus, but our alumni are all over the world. You know that they're going to connect with them again, maybe through something like Skype for Business or Google Hangouts or wherever their kind of uh, is their favorite way to connect with each other online is. There, for all our students, just happens to be doing it online. Okay, so uh, now there uh, maybe there are some technical requirements. So here's how you really support your students with technical requirements. One is to let your students know what hardware and software is required right at the beginning of the course. Maybe it's even in part of the description of the course. If it's something that you know it's going to take some time to get uh, to get. So it's almost like telling them what, what textbook they need. need uh, they're going to be maybe a little hesitant about making some purchases until they understand what they need to get and why they need to get it. So if the hardware and software is important to the course, let them know what it is and how to obtain it. 
So if that's something that they need to download, is it something that they need to go to Best Buy to go purchase? Let them know how they can do that. And again, maybe a little bit about what the purpose or why they need to do that. Hopefully when, uh, when you're ready to go and use the hardware and the software, the students will have it and they're also ready to go. So a couple of ways to make it more obtainable. If one of these software tools that you're using is available in Anywhere Apps, Anywhere Apps, that's an on-campus university uh, online location for applications that university has made available for faculty and students. Uh, this is something here we have in IU. So let the students know that uh, where they can download the app that you're having them do them. It's going to be something that's free for them to let them download, so that's going to be great, uh, definitely more accessible in terms of finances for your students. Let them know what it is, where they can get it. If there's something that that you as the instructor would like to have added to Anywhere Apps, then you might want to make a, uh, a request. Let me just add that, that link. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that DOIT, DOIT is, is going to tell you that you can absolutely have it, but at least have that conversation with your department, have a conversation with, with Do It, and see if you can get your course-specific uh, software added to these Anywhere apps. Now, if it's a software that might be more expensive, more difficult to use for your students, you might want to ask the question of yourself as to how much that supports your students, and do, do you really need to have them use that hardware or software? In some cases, it's absolutely going to be yes. The students need that to reach their core objective, so that's fine. Again, you really want to clearly specify what they are and how students can get it, and then plan for that experience. Make sure that you think, I'm sorry, make sure that uh, think about any technology requirements. Think about how it's being supported and let your students know if there's a browser where it works a little better. For instance, uh, Collaborate Ultra usually works better on Google Chrome and Firefox, although we've had an issue with Google Chrome work, uh, having the audio. Uh, hopefully that can get resolved. Uh, we usually don't recommend ever anymore Internet Explorer. In fact, it's no longer supported. And you know, in some cases, you want to look at whether it's going to work on a PC or a Mac. All of these things are important uh, for when you're picking out technology, but also it really supports your students that you let them know that. So I think about the Google Chromebook as an example. Google Chromebooks are great affordable technology resources. And yesterday I heard on NPR uh, school districts that are using them uh, for the students, very inexpensive, very powerful. Uh, but you can't actually uh, add any software to them. Uh, they're not really meant, oh, they're really only meant to work with Google products. And these would be like um, uh, plugins uh, that you use with Google. However, it is a web browser. So, for instance, if you have uh, your students working on something that requires them to use uh, Word, they may be able to access Word through Office 365, okay? So, if there's something, a software that's really important to your course and your students are going to need it, you're going to want to make sure that they know and that they have a Google Chrome, a Chromebook, that they have, uh, if they, they have one, but uh, Google Chromebook does not allow them to install any specific software. That, that they need to find an alternative computer, whether that's going to a public library, borrowing a friend's computer for that particular purpose. Just again, um, once again, letting them know uh, what they need and how they can get it and what they're going to need it for. So here at NIU, remember, let your students know that DOIT Service Desk, 753-8100, let me just put that phone number in here. Okay. Is available for them. Uh, they will not only provide them with support, I think they're also op uh, open until 10 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday. Let students know that the service desk is available through phone or email. I usually tell my students that if they have a technical problem to immediately alert the service desk and also to CC me. And so if they're able to get help, uh, if they're able to help them, I also have evidence that they're having difficulty and they might, uh, and they might help when we troubleshoot through it later on. Uh, now there's also a knowledge base. Okay, let me just put that down. And that's the do it knowledge base. 
that students may want to use on the weekend uh, because do it uh, service desk is not open. Now that has a lot of job age just in time tutorials for students if they're having any technical issues. So refer them to that knowledge base if they have those types of questions or if uh, if you're predicting maybe there's something that they might stumble over or at first you give them some links to the knowledge base. Uh, so you might want to use this link. Also, faculty development has its own teaching with Blackboard website. Um, I'll put that link in there here. And that's that uh, uh, you guys, faculty have access to that. We've But we've also developed, in addition to faculty, we've also developed a few pages for students. And so our focus is on faculty and instructor and teaching staff and graduate assistants. Uh, so we don't focus as much on students, but we have pulled together a few resources for them. And if you go to that website, you'll see on the left-hand side, as you scroll down just a little bit, you will then see uh, for students. This is also very, very beneficial. Okay, so we're at the end of our session. I want to make sure that you, if you have any questions or any comments that you have, um, I will wait for them. I'm asking them, soliciting questions. But I do want to tie this back to how this does fit. Oh, well, you know, hold on. Oh, you know, actually, no, hold on. <laughs> you can still ask the question, but I realize that I, I skipped ahead. So my final suggestion for technology support is to take advantage of lynda.com. We have an institutional site license for lynda.com here at NIU. And so there's something that you would like your students to learn about more, but it's more foundational and it's secondary to your content. I would like you to consider using uh, lynda.com in the tutorials that may have that they have available there. So for instance, if you require your students to use Excel. There are courses, many tutorials on how to use Excel. So you're sticking to maybe maybe your uh, courses on accountancy or statistics or whatever else that you're using Excel for. And you may find that your students could really use a refresher on using Excel. You might want to add a link to lynda.com and let Linda provide that technical support for you. Now, I want to I want to emphasize that here at NIU, in order to have access that we all have our Linda, they have to go through go.niu.edu slash Linda, and it's going to ask them to log in with their username at the Shibboleth uh, page. And once they do that, they are uh, they'll be able to go in and, and, and have at it. There is so much really cool material uh, on lynda.com. So before we advance to the next slide, I want to ask once again if there are any questions. I'm not seeing any coming up. Oh, thank you, Xiaoshu. All right, so now that we're at the end of our session, I want to make sure that if you have any questions that you, you've asked them, which I've asked already. I do want to tie this back to how does this fit into our quality matters standards for online course design. So this is a really long, thank you, Sharif. It's a really long sentence um, because it does span two different quality matters standards. I don't usually read off my slides, but I think there's some value in reading this particular slide. So, I'm going to read it. Quality online courses have a clear description of how technical support is offered, and that's standard 7.1, along with standard, uh, along with access to accessibility policies and services, academic and student support to help learners succeed. To meet the needs of all students, the course navigation is easy to use, and that's the other standard, 8.1. Information on all accessibility technologies is provided. Students are provided with alternative access to course materials. Design facilitates readability, and multimedia is an enhancement and not a barrier. Okay, so again, it's a lot. But I think it gives you some ideas on how you can incorporate some of these things into your own online course. Now I'll be sending you a follow-up again with the recording link so you can go back and review the this recording if you'd like. I'm also going to be providing a checklist or what I call quick guide. So if you'd like to use those quick uh, checklist or quick guides to remind you uh, of the different processes that we discussed, these you can pull uh, pull them out whenever you're designing a course. And those links I've already talked about there, it's going to be really, it's going to be included in, in, the, in the quick guide. And it's really going to really bring your course up to the next level as it relates to usability, accessibility, and student support. 
Okay, finally, that, that link email that uh, I'll be sending out includes a survey that, I, um, that I'm going to be adding to the chat area. This is the follow-up feedback survey. Okay. Yes, we do have a copy of the Quality Matters Standard Checklist. Actually, um, it's funny, I, I have to make a change because I think that the previous one is based on uh, something that was before the recent update. So I'm going to make the change, and that's what I'll be sending out to everyone. Once again, I always appreciate feedback from everyone. Uh, to kind of change up my workshops, maybe you have a new idea, a new strategy that that you would love to see incorporated. I'm always, I'm always really available to feedback, so if you just take a couple of minutes to fill out the feedback, I, I'd sure appreciate that. And, and once again, you have the link here. All right, so, um, so here's what we talked about the last 15 minutes or so. Your course design should reflect a commitment to accessibility and usability for all students. Also that the support is important to students' success and should be made accessible to all students, including our online students, and to take advantage of any of the tools or services available to you and your students. They are all out there, and they're becoming more and more useful and accessible, all of these cool tools and services. So again, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dan Cabrera, and here's my contact information once again. And I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes to answer any specific questions. Um, let's see, Brian asked, is an alternative access pertaining to access to the online course or software that is used for class assignments? Alternative. Let me think about that one. You're welcome, Anthony. You're welcome, Lauren. Uh, is, access, is alternative access pertaining to the online course or software? I think that you're talking about the online course materials as opposed to the software. That actually would be this access to the more accessible for, for the software would be dependent on the uh, manufacturer of, of the software. And once again, that's something that you're looking at before you include that software by looking at their policies for an unaccessibility. By looking at that, you would, um, uh, you'd be able to determine whether that's something you really want to include. If it's not accessible, then of course, you'd have to reconsider using it, perhaps maybe looking for an alternative, maybe a more accessible piece of software. All right, Brian? You're welcome. Okay. So I'm just hanging out here, and we got another minute or so like this. So any questions? Once again, I want to thank everyone for being active participants in today's session. I really look forward to uh, seeing you all at a future uh, session. Well, seeing you. I mean, we're not really seeing each other, but all right. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Sharif. Yes, I will be sending out a copy of all that uh, for you. Happy to do that. I want to wish you all a pleasant afternoon. And once again, thank you so much for, for participating in the session today. Take care too, Sharif.